This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha, I'm Mufi Hanneman. Welcome again to Tourism 101 here on Think Tech as we bring you issues that have a strong relationship to our tourism industry. Today, our guest is Andrew Robbins, the Chief Executive Officer of the Honolulu Authority Rapid Transit. Yes, rail has been around for a long time, and of course, you always have people that want to see it occur, and then those who have some questions and concerns. Today, we're going to go right to the gentleman who's on the hot seat uh, to ensure that there is a completion to this project, since the decision has already been made, and is working hard each and every day. Welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. You know, um, you may be new uh, to this job, relatively speaking, uh, but uh, certainly you're not new to the islands. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship and history with Hawaii? Uh, sure, and you're correct. I, I, I think I made my first trip here in 1990, and I became the project manager on the last go-around for, for RAL, which was occurring in the early 90s, and I relocated here uh, to work on the project. And uh, although the project did not proceed at that time, I did meet my wife, and uh, you know, as a result, I've been uh, connected to the islands ever since. So your wife is from here? She, she spent many, many years here. She's been here, uh, although she did not grow up here, she uh, has been here for well over 30 years. So you have relatives here? I do. I have extended family here, and my son was born here as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very good. Now, what brought you back to the islands to take on a job that is not easy? Well, I've had a long career in the private sector, and as I mentioned, I was here in the early 90s as a project manager for the consortium that had won the contract at that time to build the rail. And then I came back in, in the 2000s when, when you were mayor, you uh, reinvigorated the project and uh, started the process up again. So I came back again uh, as a member of the private sector looking to get involved in the project from that side. So, so when you left Honolulu, uh, when, uh, uh, after the, uh, the, the project was starting to, to, to move forward uh, and, and your company uh, was uh, then assigned you someplace else, what were you doing in the interim period between the time you came back to Honolulu and when you left? Right. Well, I, I had many different uh, opportunities with my company at the time. Uh, as a project manager, as a project engineer, and also in the business development area. So I, I spent a lot of time actually around the world in different parts of the world uh, working on various projects similar Where to Where were some project. of those places? Well, for example, some of my key experiences were in Singapore, uh, where we started up a uh, driverless light rail system similar to what we're doing here. Uh, that was a really uh, a special moment for me in my career, working in Singapore with a very forward-thinking government. Uh, I also lived in Hong Kong for three years, where I was responsible for projects throughout Asia, but particularly in mainland China. And so that, again, was another fantastic experience. In, and I was always involved in rail transit all these years. So why don't we drill down and talk specifically, because you're in the construction phase now. Can you tell us a little bit about your background in construction management and overseeing construction projects of a transit right. system or rail system? Right. Well, first of all, my education was always geared to this type of work. I, uh, I'm an electrical engineer uh, by training, but then I specialized in my master's program in the management of large construction and engineering projects. So I, I really had a background educationally in this field. And then as I... Uh, started my career and, and continued in my career in the rail transit industry. I was in all phases of uh, project management, project engineering, business development. So I really had a good background in terms of not only the construction of these projects, but the development of these projects, the economics, finance, uh, you know, various aspects of how a project like this comes together, how you construct it, and, and very importantly, how do you start the project up get it ready for operations, all of the technology that overlays on top of the, the concrete and steel part of the project is very important. And that's where we are right now here on the Honolulu project. You know, Andrew, uh, Andy, every mayor since Neil Blaisdell, Neil Blaisdell, Frank Fossey, myself, Jeremy Harris, and my two successors, Peter Carlo and 
for Caldwell, somehow I've always been fixated on doing a rail transit system. Why is it going to be different this time, that we're actually going to cross the goal line in your estimation? Well, I, first of all, I think you all were fixated on it because we have a perfect corridor for, for a, a major rail transit project here on Oahu between the mountains and the ocean where the majority of the population lives, where the majority of the employment is, is just a natural corridor. And I know it was planned that way over many, many years on Oahu. So it really just made sense that uh, there needed to be this high capacity uh, transit solution to complement the very fine bus service that we have here. Um, so it, it, it was important to have a champion such as yourself to get that project off the ground and up and running. I think uh, you know one of the things that we've learned when I came back on this project about a year and a half ago, uh, there were many issues in terms of really just, the, as I mentioned, project management, uh, construction. We've learned a lot of lessons uh, from the initial uh, construction aspects of the project in the West. We've taken those lessons forward and we're applying them as we come through the airport area now and now as we come into the city center area. We're applying a lot of lessons learned uh, uh, and things that, that we should be doing, and we're managing the project, I think, much more effectively now going forward. So I guess what you're saying is that there really is no other option, given uh, the fact that we have a very, um, we have a linear route, it's tailor-made for something like this, we can't really expand towards the ocean uh, or the sea. So let's talk about cost, and that's on everybody's mind. You know, that uh, when they read about, you know, seemingly the cost is rising again, but I know in your opinion you have a very different take because you've inherited a lot of those issues and you've tried to resolve whether it's settlements, whether it's change orders, cost over and so forth. Talk a little bit about that. Okay, sure. Well, when I started in September 2017, it was actually the same day that the special session of legislature had ended and the governor and the mayor were signing the bills that authorized the additional funding that the project needed to be completed to Al Moana. So it was a very important day for me to be starting. Talk and about walking right into the fried bread. Right into it, and the message was very clear. You know, here's the funding you need, make it work. And I, I'm a very serious guy, so I took that very seriously. And I think as I looked at the situation, the one thing that was missing really as an answer back from the authority was there, was, there wasn't any certainty that was being told to the elected officials. Uh, you know, it was very uncertain. And you know, you get a large uh, project like this, you, there is an element of risk, and you can't escape that, but you have to learn how to manage risk. And I think that's where we put a lot of energy, really starting with my immediate pre predecessor, Christian Murthy, and then I carried it forward in, ter in terms of putting a much more effective risk management program in place to create more certainty so that we would live within our means on the budget and we would meet our commitments on the schedule. So for the person out there just kind of listening to some of these terms, explain what you mean by risk management practices. Okay, so the, one of the things that we needed to do uh, much more effectively was first of all to identify all of the risks that we would face on the project. And it, it sounds impossible, but it really isn't if you put together strong workshops of people that, that are cross-section of the project, contractors, engineers, uh, staff and consultants, you really can start to identify all of the risks that you will face on the project. And then once we have that identified, we can put expected um, cost for each of the elements of the project as well as a risk provision. So if, if we do have an issue, uh, that we have to spend more money on a particular task, we have a provision for that. And then we also have an element of unallocated contingency for the unknowns that, you know, issues that we have not identified. And we run that all through a, a very a big analysis, a, a risk management analysis, so that essentially the idea is if you overrun in one area, you underrun in another area, or you, you inform management about how you can take action to mitigate risk or to avoid risk. And by doing these things, you can actually start to control your budget and your schedule. For two years now, we have been on budget, on schedule. We have not asked for any more additional funding. And I think the process is working. 
and we'll continue to work towards So why does the media keep uh, emphasizing that whenever uh, there's another figure, <laughs> financially speaking, come out of rail, that the cost is continuing to increase? Why is that? Well, the, the process, if, if you will, of uh, uh, managing or dealing with the cost overruns uh, materializes in something called a change order. So we've given an instruction and a contract to a contractor uh, for so much money. The, something happened where we had to spend more money on that particular contract. Eventually, we have to issue change orders. So unfortunately, we're in a position where every change order is reported as if it's an increase to the budget. But we've already provisioned for these change orders, meaning that it's already in our budget. And as long as we manage effectively, as I just mentioned, uh, even though we have to issue change orders, which cleans up the paperwork, so to speak, we're still within our budget. Now, I signed off on only one contract of the series of contracts you put out to start the project. But I know there was a significant uh, change order that you came to some kind of settlement over recently uh, with Ansaldo. Can you talk about that? Right. Well, Ansaldo has a very unique contract. It's what we call our core systems contract. So supplying the trains, the controls, really all of the technology for the project is their responsibility. They manufacture the equipment, they have to install the equipment on site, then they have to test everything and eventually put it into service and do the operations and maintenance. So it's a very comprehensive contract and it was uh, done as what we call a lump sum contract. What year was that contract signed? Uh, around 20, 2011, I believe, is when yeah. the contract was executed. Peter Carlisle was the mayor then. Right. Yeah. So they bid lump sum and they bid to a certain timeline some eight years ago. Obviously the timeline has changed, mm -hmm. so now we have to remedy their contract and, and realize the fact that the timeline has changed. They were delayed, but you know, even though they were delayed, there are things they should have been doing and could have been doing even though uh, there were certain construction delays. For example, supplying the trains are not really affected by construction delays. So we had to negotiate with Ansaldo and deal with what we call concurrent delays and also delays that are not of their doing. And we were able to have a willing partner in, in Saldo to have a very effective negotiation. And we were able to conclude that a couple of weeks ago with what I think was a very amicable settlement in terms of the delays that were incurred over the life of the project so far. So, so um, you were able to, to really achieve, well, two things I take away from what you're saying here. One, that you already had that set aside in your budget to handle these type of situations but the city could have paid a whole lot more had you not engaged on Saldo in a conversation, in a discussion, uh, to reach an amicable settlement. That's exactly right. It was all provisioned. Our settlement was well within our budget, so it's well within the $8.165 billion that we're managing to. Uh, and I don't think we would have gotten there without uh, a, a, a willing partnership. This is something that I've really tried to foster since I've come here. Probably has to do with my private sector experience where you know, I understand the pressures on the contractors as well. So we try to sit down, we try to understand that we're really partners in this. To be successful on this project, we have to work together. We, the authority, don't actually build anything our, our partners do. So I've worked on those relationships, and when you have willing partners come to the table, you can reach a meeting of the minds and come up with an effective solution. Our guest uh, is Andy Robbins. We are talking about rail and all things rail. Uh, we're going to take a short pause for the cause, uh, and when we come back, we're going to drill down on how this system will benefit our number one industry in Hawaii. I'm talking about tourism. I'm Mufi Hanman. Our guest this morning, again, is Andrew Robbins, the Chief Executive Officer of HART. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They said I could play, so any chance to play at all, you know, that's my life. I love music. Yeah, I so do. Aloha, I'm Tim Mappicella. I'm here with... Cynthia Sinclair. And this is Trump Week. 
It's going to appear every Friday at 11 a.m. between Jay Fidel, Cynthia, and myself. We talk about Trump, the activities, and the news stories for that week as it pertains to the Trump administration. We hope you tune in and watch the fun. Aloha. See you then. How's it, everybody? Welcome again to Think Tech here on Tourism 101. Uh, Andy, you know, people think that uh, that's such a difficult job. A lot of it weighs on you each and every day. But I know what made you really depressed uh, these past few weeks. Your Pittsburgh Steelers <laughs> got knocked out. And you are a rabid Steelers fan. And, of course, uh, uh, I, I, I had to tease you because I met uh, Juju Schuster. Right. Uh, you know, star wide receiver for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I sent you a picture uh, of, uh, of me and, and Juju because he was here for the Apology Football Hall of Fame. You are, I think besides you and the Lieutenant Governor, you, you guys are the two most rabid Pittsburgh Steelers <laughs> fans. What's your connection to Pittsburgh? Well, I, uh, I moved there after college uh, to start my career uh, with uh, a company called Westinghouse Electric at the time, uh, which was headquartered there. And uh, you can't spend two weeks in Pittsburgh without adopting the Steelers. I arrived a Giants fan, and within two weeks I was black and gold. But I'm happy to say that Pittsburgh people are involved in this project. Uh, and Saldo's U.S. headquarters is in Pittsburgh, so we have a lot of hardworking Pittsburgh people contributing to this project. Uh, have you converted your son, who's quite an athlete, uh, into being a, a Steelers fan also? Because oh. I want him. I want him to be a Kansas City Chiefs fan, <laughs> Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. He's uh, black and yellow. <laughs> <laughs> Got to work on that. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about how rail relates to the tourism industry and, and, and why you believe this will benefit uh, the state's number one provider of jobs. Okay, sure. But first of all, if we look at the employees, you know, the backbone of the uh, visitor industry, uh, so many employees live in the western parts of the island, whether it be well, starting in Kalihi, Waipahu, Eva Beach, and other communities in the West. Uh, so many of them live there, and they're, they're dealing with the daily commute back and forth to work. And then when they get to work, they have to deal with parking. Uh, we're going to have a rail system that really benefits uh, uh, employees for the visitor industry. Uh, goes right through Waipahu, serves Eva Beach, and out to Kapolei. Uh, so I think uh, you know, it's really going to transform lives. Uh, people will be able to get an extra hour or even two hours of sleep in the morning because they'll have predictable transportation available to them uh, with the rail project. So I think that's a major benefit. But from the visitor side as well, I mean, we, I've been on uh, certain parts of our system already and the views are outstanding, first of all. I think people are really going to enjoy some of, the, some of the views that they'll be able to get from the rail system. But, you know, really beyond that, and I think one of the untold stories so far of the rail system is the storytelling that we're trying to do at our various stations. And, you know, Hawaiian people are storytellers by nature, and uh, we're incorporating uh, these stories into the station, starting with the station names, which will be Hawaiian names that tell a little bit about where the station is located. We have Hawaiian art, which uh, also... Uh, contributes to storytelling and then we'll have various information plaques within the station. So I think visitors as they use the rail system uh, they'll be able to learn more about uh, the history of this island and the history of the people that were here on this island. Talk about uh, what I've often uh, learned about this integrated multimodal system and how a worker uh, will be able to utilize the system. I mean um, and I think that's one of the options, I think, that's out there. We're having rail uh, really enhances that person's choices when he or she is coming into a town or Waikiki for employment. Right. Well, first of all, we talked about the, uh, the nature of the rail system being the backbone, the high-capacity backbone of the transportation system on this island. Uh, but it needs to be integrated with other modes of transportation. So, for example, the bus system, which is an award-winning bus system, We'll be able, and we're working very hard with the city right now to make sure that it's fully integrated, that the bus will, and the rail will work well together. Even for our interim service, which we intend to open up in uh, 2020, we're working hard with the city to make sure that the two systems work very well together and people can get uh, from where they're starting their trip 
to where they need to go effectively, conveniently, comfortably. But beyond even rail and bus, you know, we have, a, we have an excellent Beaky uh, uh, bike share program uh, that I use myself, and that, that will be integrated as well. So you'll be able to use one fare card, if you will, whether you ride on the rail, whether you ride on the bus, or you want to use a Beaky And that's bike. called the Holo card. Right, the Holo card is being introduced right now uh, with Hart and the city, and we're testing it already on the bus. That'll benefit rail because we'll have it fully tested and working on the bus system by the time the rail starts up in 2020. So if I'm living in Kapole or Eva Beach, you know, I could take the bus to the station, take the train in, get off the train, uh, get on a bike or walk, uh, go to a certain point and then turn around and, and do the same thing. Or, or if you're driving into town and you see that traffic congestion has taken place once again or there's an accident uh, because it's at grade, you can actually park your car, jump on the station, and come into town. That's right. And we're, the goal is to make that all a predictable journey so you can count on that journey each and every day. You know exactly how much time you need for transportation to get to and from your destination. So I think that's going to be a major improvement in the quality of life for for people that live here uh, based on the unpredictability you have today when you get on the freeway and you don't know exactly what's going to happen. So two quick questions. Some have said, you know, you don't have to do rail. We have an excellent bus service. Why don't we just expand the bus service uh, and have more buses? What's your answer to that? I think two, two issues with that. One is that uh, we need more capacity. So are we going to really build more roads and freeways? to make the bus more effective. My understanding is that the average speed of the bus has gone down in recent years because bus gets stuck in traffic like everybody else. So I think that's one issue. And then over a longer journey, rail is actually a more cost-effective mode of transportation. So if you want to manage your overall cost, to have a rail bus solution when you get into the kind of passenger moving capacities that we need on this island is more effective than an all-bus system. You know, some have said, uh, you know, we're not going to have uh, a lot of people riding the, 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 the rail initially, so uh, they fear the fact that we spend all this money, yet when it starts, everybody's still in their comfort zone driving their cars. How do you respond to that? Well, I can tell you that probably one of our biggest worries is what if we have more riders than we expect? Mm -hmm. So working together with the city, we're already planning uh, for what happens and how we can respond if our ridership is higher. I think, yes, we have a car culture here, but we also have a very high uh, ridership on our bus system and our public transportation system. So we know we have built-in ridership. We know we have demand for public transportation. And, you know, even with the introduction of ride-sharing services like Uber, Lyft, you know, the, the people are looking at the cost of their trip where I think Uber and Lyft will really contribute is that what we call our first mile, last mile connectivity from and to our transit stations. It's all uh, going to work together, and rail is an important element in that comprehensive solution. So Andy, also talk about the fact that as people have continuing concerns, it'll probably happen to the day you actually start service. Uh, how seriously do you take community involvement, community participation, people coming forward and sharing their manau, especially as it affects those where the rail system is coming through? Well, community uh, participation is essential, really, to everything we do. We have a public involvement team that goes out every day, and we describe our impacts that construction will have on people. We, we provide information on the system what the benefits of the system are, how to use the system. And we're really looking for feedback, too, when we are out with the community, whether it's feedback from the community, feedback from businesses, because we can work around issues. So, for example, if, a, if there's a community fair in a, a particular location on a particular weekend, we don't have to be working in that particular location. We can work around those things. Same with businesses. If businesses are having a sale on a, on a Saturday, we'll make sure that we can work around and not, not uh, inhibit access to that business. So the two-way dialogue with the community really is essential in a project like this. You know, I've always said, if you like real, you're going to love transit-oriented development. Uh, in, in, in my experience as mayor, nothing was moving in Kaka'ako until we said rail is coming through. 
Uh, I think the same will happen for Kali. So touch on TOD and touch on the concept that you're really driving called P3, public-private partnership, where you're going to lure uh, and entice private sector, the private sector putting monies into this project, so we're just not totally relying on public dollars. Okay, a lot there. But uh, on TOD, transit-oriented development, we're working closely with the city. Uh, I think the city has come out with, and the state for that matter, both have really excellent TOD plans around each of the 21 stations. And we're working with uh, the city and the state to, to start moving these plans into implementation. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the rail system is more than just a mobility solution. It will address affordable housing. It will uh, uh, relate to workforce uh, housing, things like that. Kalihi, for example, is a, a My fantastic hometown. neighborhood. <laughs> so conveniently located and so much opportunity for workforce housing, for example, uh, close to a station. And, you know, if you think about it, families that have two, three, four automobiles, if they can get rid of even one automobile, uh, the savings are in the thousands of dollars. And I think once rail is introduced as an alter alternative means to get to work, to get to other places, I think families will say, What about I P3? I, I don't need two, three cars. Yeah. You know? P3 is, uh, again, it's public-private partnership. Uh, it's something that we wanted to look at as a global best practice on how we could complete the project. We still have over a billion dollars worth of work to do, especially in the city center portion of the project. Uh, and then we also are looking at long-term operations and maintenance. Going back to what I said about creating certainty, living within our means, uh, we believe that P3 offered an opportunity to achieve those goals. And we're very encouraged uh, by our dialogue with industry in terms of uh, them being able to respond to our needs to not only build the remaining part of our project, but to operate it successfully over the next 30 years. And, we want to make sure once we, we finish this project that it's, it's sustainable, it's clean, comfortable, and safe over the long term. And that's why we're, we're doing One last question. Free. You touched on it. Interim service to begin in 2020? Very focused on that. We have 10 miles of, uh, of our guideway completed in the west. We're rapidly completing our first nine stations. We have Ansaldo mobilized by getting the technology installed and tested. We want to get the system up and running for those first 10 miles and start to get people onto the system so that, you know, people have suffered through a lot of bad news on this project, construction impact. It's time to get people on these trains and start to demonstrate some of the benefits and how this can improve their lives. Ah, uh, yeah. The best is yet to come. Andrew, thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for joining us. This is uh, your host uh, for Tourism 101. I guess this morning has been Andrew Robbins, and I hope that he, in sharing his manao with us this morning, this very important project, uh, he helped shed light on some of the things that are going on, and most importantly, uh, the dedicated commitment he has made, he and his staff, his hardworking staff at heart, to ensure a successful completion of this project. Mahalo, aloha kia thank you for joining us.